There we go. Right. It's blinking, and something interesting should happen. Okay. So, morning, everybody. Are you having a good conference? Yeah. Trust the audiences. Right. Welcome to this session on uh, building a just enough admin solution in Formula One. Uh, this is very much a notes from the field session. Uh, see, they make some noise, but not as loud as you guys. Um, the, uh, this is very much a notes from the field session. Uh, my contact details are up there. As you can see, I uh, have a one-person consulting company called Mobula Consulting. Uh, Mobula, for those of you who are not into uh, deep sea fish, is a kind of, uh, of a ray, often mistaken for a manta ray when you can't see it properly. Um, bit of my uh, bit of agenda for the for the session. It's a classic notes for the field session. So we're going to do an introduction, a bit of background. What was the problem? Then what did we do to, to, uh, to solve the problem? And the important question at the end, are we any the wiser? Uh, believe me, I found this a very educational process in the sense of, well, that taught me a lesson. Um, so my background, go on mouse, you can do this. All right, I'll use the keyboard instead. Um, my background, I uh, spent 10 years working here. That's uh, Microsoft's uh, building in the UK, as you can tell from the, uh, the flag on top of it, and you can tell the age of, it, age of the photo from the Microsoft logo. Um, I left there in about 2010, and I thought, well, I've been really lucky. I've, I've had my dream job for a little while, and that was all great. Um, I went to work for a, a small uh, startup company that a friend of mine had set up. Wasn't enjoying that terribly much, and thought, where do I want to be? And I'd always been a, a fan of Formula One, and I went looking around some websites, and uh, I found Mercedes were advertising for a software architect to look at uh, messaging and mobility. So I ended up working with these guys. Uh, for those of you who don't follow Formula One, uh, the two guys nearest the camera there are, have the last three Drivers World Championships between them, and the three senior guys behind them are the two guys that actually run the team, and the guy in the middle uh, those of you who are into uh, 80s and 90s pop music may remember the Proclaimers. He's not about to burst into a, I, I could walk 500 miles. He's the guy that actually runs the uh, engine development. Uh, if you see the pillar just at the top of the screen there, uh, I'm somewhere in the mass in amongst that group there. <laughs> and, and I can point you to, I am in the picture, trust me. This was the end of the... Uh, 2015 season when we just won our second world championship. So that's what the, the silverware is in the foreground. Um, the uh, way I usually explain this to people is that's actually Lewis in his car, Lewis Hamilton, uh, and uh, if he didn't get his email, it was my fault. Uh, it's a far easier way of explaining what you do in IT. Now, Formula One, for those who don't know, and I realise talking to an audience in the United States, not everybody follows Formula One as a kind of motorsport. Uh, it is one of the world's major sporting uh, events. Um, apart from the Olympic Games and the World Cup for what we would call football, uh, I suppose I should call association football or soccer, just to avoid any doubt about what kind of football, those have the biggest television audiences of all, and Formula One is in third place after that. Uh, it's contested over a season of typically 20 or so races. Uh, there are 10 teams, um, the majority of which are based in the UK. You can draw a circle of about a 50 mile radius and you'll, in, uh, you'll take in about half of um, motorsport in what they call the, the motorsport valley. Um, it's a pretty large undertaking and it's generally viewed, certainly outside the United States, as the premier form of motorsport. Um, Mercedes have won the, both drivers and constructors championships for the last three years, so they were obviously quite, a, quite an enjoyable place to be. And they, that gives you a sort of background to the industry. There are a few things when we talk about IT, people like to use cars as an analogy for IT. And you hear people say things like, oh yeah, it's like trying to change the, the tires on the car when it's still going down the straight at 200 miles an hour and things like that. I need to tell you, 
IT and racing cars are very bad um, analogies for each other. Thank you. Um, occasionally, I'll forget a... I should have done it. Yeah, there you go. Um, just as a quick side story, I was explaining something at a, on a, on a session previously, and somebody said, is such and such stored? And I was trying to explain that this was a, a thing in a database. And I was doing, it's, it's an up and down thing. You get them in architecture, you get Corinthian ones. Could I find the word column? <laughs> <laughs> so, why motor racing isn't like IT? First off, who would love to work in an IT organisation where you have 350 support people per user? <laughs> right? We basically have, the team has two drivers, um, plus a reserve driver. Actually, Mercedes don't take their reserve driver with them uh, to, the, to the races. They, they subcontract their reserve driver out to other teams, and if they need them, they go and pinch the guy who's driving for another team. Uh, the teams are a bit cagey about how many people they employ. Uh, the four biggest teams, we think, all employ more than 700 people. Uh, that excludes the people who make the engines. Um, the other thing is, if you think about what happens with a car, this year's car has got nothing to do with last year's car. There are almost no parts in common. Last year's car, almost nothing to do with the year before, and so on, going back. We basically do a complete redesign of the car for each racing season. So if you take our two users and say we have 20 racing events and the car runs for 10 hours in an event, we've got 400 hours of use time and then we throw the system away and start again. Now, okay, we, we know about DevOps and rapid deployment, but boy, that's, that, you know, that's not a lot of user hours per redesign. The other good news, we've all had computers that don't go more than three hours without a reboot. That's, that, that's usually seen as a problem. The car never has to run for more than three hours. And who'd like to get away with 95% system availability? Right? If you think about one race of the season, the car breaks down. That's OK. Generally, you'd, you'd live with losing the car once a season. You could also blame the user a lot of the time, because it's the driver chucking the thing off the track. So, <laughs> But here's the serious one. Anybody here work in finance? Anybody here work in, um, I was going to say drugs, but pharmaceuticals might be a better way of putting it. <laughs> Suppose one of your people came to you and said, I've got this new innovation, and we need to release it to our customers in a couple of weeks' time. You'd have a fit. Your regulators would have a fit. In F1, there is this mentality that if you can put an, something that gives you an advantage on the car, you put it on the car. You then figure out, if you've got to keep it on the car, how you make it sustainable. If you put it on with chewing gum and a bit of gaffer tape, uh, duct tape in the States, if, you, if, you put, if it's held on with you know, chewing gum and, and string and it, it gives you an advantage, that's fine and you may let you figure out then how you make it sustainable. If you say, oh yeah, to integrate that properly, I can do that for you in six months' time, that's six months where your car isn't going as fast as it, as it could be going. That's six months where you're getting beaten. Oh. So everything is... Um, I'm, I'm actually looking for the gentleman who, who, who gave me the phrase. He's, he's not in the room, I don't think. But there was a gentleman uh, yesterday who talk, talked about the, uh, the way things were run as uh, fire-ready aim. Uh, <laughs> So that tends to make um, an organizational culture that isn't the easiest in the world for IT. So how did this project get started? Well, the first thing was I came in to look at um, <laughs> Link and Exchange. So the first thing I did was I went through Active Directory. And as that slide shows you that was uh, lit off the can, worms all over the place. Um, we had so many things wrong with Active Directory, uh, it's almost embarrassing to my former employer to list them. So I, I'm not going to go through them all. But we had major things with nobody ever wanted mail to be deleted. Um, this in itself is a, uh, gives rise to a whole bunch of stories. 
um, but the desire to hang on to mail forever um, can, a, can be a very useful way of doing yourself harm. Um, it has been reported in the press, so this is not spilling too many beans. The tax authorities in the UK were looking into something about how the Mercedes team was uh, doing its corporate taxation. And basically, if they had planned to do something, what they were doing tax-wise was actually a, f a fiddle. However, if it had just happened all by itself, what they were doing with tax was perfectly legitimate. And so they wanted to find some mail from six years previously to find out whether anybody had suggested that they do this. And of course, we've kept every mail since the year dot. So we were going back through mail. And of course, the more we went back through stuff, the more we couldn't find anything to prove it, and the less they believed that there was nothing there to, to find. But keeping every mailbox forever meant we kept every user account forever. And then I found that we weren't disabling user accounts. We weren't updating user accounts with correct information. A whole raft of stuff. The other thing that happened was just after I arrived, they said, HR have got some real problems with their system. You know a bit of SQL, don't you? And I kind of went, yeah, a bit. I, I kind of get by. Go and have a look. And so I actually had access to the HR system, and I found the quality of data that HR had was actually really good. For the first time in my entire career, I actually was working with HR people who were doing good stuff. And being ex-Microsoft, Microsoft have a system called Head Tracks, which synchronizes stuff into Active Directory. So I thought, OK, I will be clever. I'll build something like a mini version of Head Tracks. So HR updates something on their side, and if they say, this person has moved departments, it goes into AD. If they say, uh, this person's changed their job title, it gets moved into AD. They change their manager, you get the picture. Even down to, these people, according to HR, don't work here anymore. We better disable their accounts. Oh, that one's being used as a service account. Oh, dear. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we flushed all of that. We, we flushed a lot of stuff out doing this. Um, and we, so we, we found a lot of, lot of issues. And we actually got to the point where we said, OK, IT own email addresses and phone numbers. When those aren't in sync, we can't push them into the HR system, but we can send HR a file and say, import this into, into your system, and then you'll be in sync with us. Everything about people leaving, so when HR said, this person leaves on this date, we updated their account expiration date in, uh, in AD. When they said they've changed department, they've changed job title, they've changed manager, we, we put that into AD. So I had the PowerShell script that ran and did all this. And of course, um, the expedient way to do, do everything in, the, in an organization like a, like a racing team is you give everybody the maximum possible admin privileges. Just as another quick aside, uh, I've been there about five, six days. Uh, there was a first line support guy, and I, I just happened to watch him uh, remote desktop onto a server, and he typed in as the username administrator. This was the domain administrator. I can't. He's looking in, not as an admin. He's looking as the administrator. Watched him do a couple of things and said, "Ryan, why are you logging in as administrator?" Oh, well, if I log in with my admin account, I get all these UAC boxes that pop up. <laughs> but they're suppressed if you log in as the domain admin. So this was the kind of thing we were up against. <laughs> so I've got my baby head track system working. And I sat there and went, this runs as a, uh, as a full administrator. And it's easy for somebody to go and interfere with my script. Now, if you imagine somebody does something like the example I've put on the slide there, get AD computer pipe to stop computer, um, incidentally, in one of the sessions earlier on, I was talking about something I wrote called Start Parallel. Um, and Start Parallel, he says, hang on, let's just, I might have to do that. So Start Parallel just starts multiple threads to do something. This is just going to, um, in fact, just do that. Um, that's just going to spit out the numbers from 1 to 10. But that 
progress bar you saw going across there was creating 10 different run spaces to run them in. So I could actually do get AD computer pipe to start parallel stop computer and stop everything in the, in the company in about 15 seconds. Now, let's imagine that I schedule that for, oh, I don't know, uh, just as the cars are going out for qualifying. Um, you can see, uh, yeah, it, it, um, yeah, the, um, the funny thing was, I, I said that the, uh, the world there came to an end last year. Um, they told me this, and, they, and I went back and, and, and said to my, uh, my boss, I, I just had this meeting with the, uh, with the director, and he said, uh, terribly sorry, but we're going to give you a big bag of cash and, um, and, and send you out the front gate. Um, this is the other thing. Instead of, they, they've, they get rid of some very senior people in Formula One racing teams. Um, you'll probably have heard of a driver called Michael Schumacher. Um, he used to drive for Mercedes, and they decided he was surplus to requirements. And it was kind of pointed out to me that I could kick up a fuss, uh, but if they could get rid of Michael Schumacher, what were my odds like? Um, so I went back and talked to, talked to my boss, and he said, yeah, I had about an hour's warning that this was going to happen. Um, don't worry, we need you to do a few things, and we're not going to take your, your admin rights away. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I went, what? And they said, yeah, we kind of know the kind of, kind of things you could do, and if any of these things happen, in the next few months, we're going to blame you anyway. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so at this point, I had basically a small panic attack. I just went, we have too much admin here. So what I've got to do is to build a JEA solution. There are bits around that Microsoft have made available that allow you to do particular things in JEA. We actually built ours from the ground up because of the number of things we were pulling together. We were putting business logic in here as well as just letting people um, run commands straight from modules. So we pulled in a whole bunch of things. So you, you've got the list on there. We were doing uh, AD Exchange, Skirt for Business. We were also um, enabling people's accounts for Office 365 because we were just starting to take our first steps with that. And we were hooking up the uh, HR database. So what, what was the goal for all of this? Um, the first thing was that scheduled script that I was talking about, my, my mini head track system, that had to run with a standard account. It, it wasn't allowed to have any admin privileges. If I gave the account that ran the script admin privileges, I'd failed. Okay? That was, that was the, the kind of line in the sand. The other thing was we were going to try and peel away some of these permissions we'd given quite junior people. Um, that meant that we had to make their lives easier. We couldn't just replace like for like. So if we said, for example, oh yeah, we've got a new user, um, we're going to set them up for Link. We had Link Enterprise Voice, so we therefore said, well, okay, we're going to provision them for Link, but we'll also make sure that we give them a phone number and we enable voicemail for them and so on. And that, that's multiple steps usually. So part of this was to say, we'll put some business logic in there and um, will automate things. Um, I, I, I think I'm, I, I've probably lost this battle, but um, I keep trying to persuade people not to remote desktop into servers to do management. Um, second worst way of doing management that's, that's so far being invented, the worst one being to actually physically go to the box and do it. Um, I've tried saying, you know, every time you remote desktop into a server, a kitten dies, it doesn't work. People still do it. But why do people do it? And the answer is because I haven't got the right admin tools installed on my computer. So somebody comes along and says, oh, yes, I need to do something with Link. Ah, oh, I haven't got the Link admin tools installed or Skype for Business uh, tools installed, so I'll remote desktop onto the server. Okay, so let's see if we can reduce the requirement to put those admin tools on people's desktop machines. Because if we can do that, then we can also stop people remote desktoping into servers and so on. Um, and obviously, paring down the, the number of, of privileged accounts. And then also, there were a number of things of 
oh yeah, we can do that, but we need someone who actually has the, 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 the knowledge in PowerShell to come and do that. So half a dozen things that I would do for people, um, instead of coming to me, I just make available to them much more easily so that they could, they could do that, that stuff from a JEA solution. So that was, that was what we were trying to do. And we ended up, um, here's a, a grid of, basically, we had to switch stuff on, switch it off, find it or change it, and you can see those were the, the, the commands that we ended up with as remote commands. Some of these bear um, a very strong similarity to the native commands. Um, other commands were, were pretty much our own um, inventions. Uh, so you can see there, for example, we've got get HR info and get HR department. So you could go and find out what HR thought were valid departments because um, you'd be amazed, for example, the number of different ways people seem to be able to invent to spell aerodynamics. Um, and the, those kinds of things really bug me. If, it, 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 the, the other one that really bugs me is people cannot seem to enter telephone numbers correctly in E164 format. Um, especially in Britain, people have a, a tendency of writing the numbers uh, in a way that's broken and um, uh, there's a particular way that they write them that has to be, get, go and be converted. So trying to, to just make sure we used consistent data was, was part of the, the big thing there. So what did we call on from what we get from PowerShell? And I'm going to show you each of these and I'm actually going to sort of put together a, a mini JEA solution before the end of the, the presentation, uh, hopefully. And the features that we use, one is private functions. Now, not everybody's aware, I think, that each command in PowerShell has a, a, a status associated with it as to whether it's visible at the prompt or not. Um, and so you can actually hide commands so that they can only be used from inside one of your own functions. We also have what, what are called proxy functions. Now, most people will know that you've got a pecking order for, for commands so that aliases come ahead of functions which come ahead of built-in commandlets which come ahead of external scripts and executables. So if you define your own function with the same name as a commandlet, you can basically replace that commandlet. Um, restricted language modes stop you doing a bunch of things at the, uh, the prompt, like defining your own functions to circumvent uh, making things private. And then the major thing is um, remote PowerShell sessions, which provide just enough of what we need to the end user. The major thing with this is it's the session that gets elevated privilege, not the user. So the session runs with a higher, under a higher privileged account. It doesn't need privileges particularly to use that, that session. As I've said before, there's more JEA stuff available, but we built the thing from the ground up that way. There is a link, um, I'm assuming these, these slides will be available, there's a, a link uh, to a very good presentation, and the person who delivered it has just left the room. Um, <laughs> a very good presentation. It's always great when Jeffrey turns up at one of your sessions, and then just as you're about to mention him, he walks up. <laughs> um, Jeffrey did this great session on, uh, it's called, um, it, 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 it's, it's just enough admin, but it talks about a post-Snowden world and um, how Edward Snowden leaked all the stuff he did, basically because he was in an organization with too much admin. So let's try and show you some of these things then. Um, and if this goes to plan, I'm still getting used to the behavior of um, this, um, this device with an external screen. So let's take a very, very simple command. I can run something like restart, pro, uh, restart service and tell it I want to restart the spooler service. And it says, oh, great, OK. Um, I run it with what if. And it says I would have started the, uh, uh, restarted that service. So I'm now going to define a new function. So let's just define that function there. And um, 
Yeah. Run that, and it comes back, and he says, "No, you know, I'm not going to let you restart the uh, restart the spooler." And literally, all I've done is I've said, "In here, that's that's all there is in the body of that uh, that that script." But I can make it a little bit more sophisticated. I can say, "If the name equals spooler, then do something. Otherwise, don't." So I can go here, define that one, and if I come back up and say restart spooler, well it would do that, but if I said, I don't know, restart, um, let's pick another service, so we'll do uh, workstation, work, uh, it doesn't really matter actually, because it'll just go, oh, oh no you don't. So very quickly I can come along and I can define things that replace existing command line functionality. Now, I can specify the full name of that command, so I can qualify it, effectively make it look like a path, and say, I want to have specified the commandlet explicitly. But the next thing I can do is actually um, take a command and make a command a private command. So I'm going to just create a quick function that it uh, calls cd here. Okay. And, oh, sorry, called set location. It's important I, I differentiate between those two. So I can do, for example, jump dot dot, and it does exactly what you'd expect it to do. Now what I can do is I can take set location and say that's only visible privately. And I may have done this already in testing. So normally that would actually work quite happily. Let me just take another window to show you that same thing happening over here. So I can take that and say make that private and that works quite happily. Now you say you think ah oh, well you can just go back and, and change it to make it public again but if I try and run it a second time that's gone. I can't get to that that command to change its status back to being um, public any more than I can make it private a second time. So now if I use something that's an alias for that command, so I'll go cd backslash, and it basically says, there will now be a moment of cussing and swearing. Yeah, it helps when you, when you prepare these demos if you actually remember to take something out of your profile. So just bear with me two seconds. I'm going to need this window again in a minute. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to Should have done it in this window rather than the, the other one. So we'll just make sure that CD is actually pointing to the right place. So now I've got CD as an alias for set location. This should work rather better. So if I make uh, set location a private command, if I now try and run cd backslash, it turns around and says cd is an alias for set location, but set location doesn't exist anymore. I can't find set location, so you can't run set location. But if the, f the command is actually defined inside jump here, and I hope doing this out of sequence will still work, I go jump backslash, that still works. So I can still call a private function provided, sorry, I can still call a private command provided I'm doing it from a function. One other thing, and I've got a little warning to myself here of do this in a new PowerShell tab. Um, 
let's actually come across and say, let's create a new PowerShell tab. Um, watch what happens to my prompt after this command runs. Um, all of a sudden, the, the function that provides the prompt doesn't work anymore. So let's have a look and see what we've got in the function directory, for example. Ah, uh, we can't do that. OK, well, let's have a look. Oh, we can't, we can't do that either. What about evaluating expressions? No. In fact, we've lost an awful lot of the stuff we would normally have available at the, uh, the prompt there because we've taken away those features from the user. So we can use these things to start to build up an environment where we've got a very, very precise set of things that can be done in that session. And the last one, just to show you very quickly, is um, I'm going to skip over a bit. There is some security oddness that goes on here. Um, but I can connect to a remote PowerShell session, and quite a few sessions have already shown this earlier on. Um, if you want to do this on a local machine that's not domain joined, um, put aside an afternoon. Um, there are lots of, lots of things that go on and behave strangely when you do this. But now I've got a remote session, and you can see I can do who am I, and uh, you can see I'm a local user on this machine um, called the machine. Flat, Flatfish is the name of the computer. So if I exit that session, no, well, that does the same thing. Um, I can also do get PS session configuration, and I've got these sessions here. Now, you notice there's a session, uh, there's a configuration here at the bottom for managing printers, and I've given an extra user permission to connect to that session. Okay? You can also see that unlike the others, this one runs with a predefined account. This is actually going to run with my account, and it's going to use this script when it starts up. We'll come back to that in a bit. So. When you look at these session configurations, um, you can tell that here, um, this is a slightly older slide because of the PowerShell version, but comparing the normal session we connect to with a constrained endpoint, the first thing is there's a default name, which in this is Microsoft.PowerShell. It can be called remote admin, it can be called printers, it can be called anything you like when you create your own. Um, when you connect to the default one, the one I, you just saw me connecting to, there is no startup script. Whereas for mine, we've got a startup script that actually sets up the environment, does the hiding, and so on. Um, runs as a particular user. This is really critical, okay? Because this is the user that has the rights to do everything. But the other thing is, when you do run as user, you get rid of the double hop problem. Okay, because this is the zeroth hop. Okay, you've logged on as that user, and that user there, this user, so in, in my case it was called AD Updates for the, for the one at Mercedes. Um, this, because we've got the credentials for this user, we can then connect on to another, another server. Now, if you're running something like Link, one of the things that happened, the first thing that when you try and use a remote session to a Link server, you get a connection, you run the first Link command, and it goes, right, I'm going to go talk to AD. And it goes, oh, double hot problem. Can't connect to AD. None of your link commands work. As soon as you say we're going to run as a spe specific user, this, uh, that problem goes away. And then these are the people that are allowed to connect to the session. So here we can use less privileged accounts and say they can connect to this constrained session where otherwise you can only connect to the unconstrained session if you're in one of these privileged groups. And one of the things is, we, we, said to, we said to people in IT, look, if you can remember a command line, sounds like something from Kipling, actually, but um, if you can remember that the command line for how to connect to that server, you can connect and you can do this stuff remotely, even if you're not at your desk. So you can now go, oh, rats. Um, I've, 
I'm visiting a user and they don't appear to have had the correct phone number set up for them in Link, well, I can go and set their Link phone number from their computer, provided I give it my credentials to log on to the, the server. So that was actually um, a notable win. Um, import session, as it says there, creates a temporary module. That, that showed up in one of the sessions earlier on. Export session actually saves the module uh, and persists it. And we did, a, we did some, some tweaks to the module that was exported so that we could, um, uh, we could um, make it a little bit easier for our, our user community. And we'll see that in a bit. So the script is, is pretty straightforward. It was load the commands that you need. So when you, when you do um, import module, you actually say, well, OK, but I don't want to load every command in that module. So load these modules, use the commandlet switch um, to uh, narrow down the, the, the ones you're loading. Um, set everything private, and then we enable the thing you want to, to have available. That was the easiest way of doing that. And when you do everything from a setup script, um, you need to tell PowerShell that it has to load a minimum set of functions to, to basically allow some really simple stuff to work. So basically, you find you've, you've hidden exit PS session. So you can never log out of the session. So there's a route to put those things back. Then it, the big part for us was writing all the business logic. So the business logic, the various proxy functions, and so on, and finally setting the language mode. Now, I'm not going to go through this step by step, because this is just a piece of script that says, if you want to take this away and you get the slide deck, you can copy this and put it into your own code. One of the major things that I did, though, was I said, if we're running in the PowerShell ISE, don't do all these things that disable stuff in the environment, because that's going to make it really, really difficult for me to do any testing. So when you run in the PowerShell ISE, don't hide all the commands. When you're not in the ISE, when you're actually using it in anger, basically get all the commands and hide them. You would think that you wouldn't have to do aliases separately from commands uh, for, for reasons I've never quite understood. You do. And in this particular case, I've just taken a single command here, get printer, and said make get printer public again. Um, this one I'm really not going to explain. This is just how to put in the put back the um, the minimum commands that you need, and then set the language mode. Now, one of the things I was talking about before was um, you log on with credentials, but also there are cases where you need saved credentials, and. Um, a lot of people don't understand this, and I, so I've put this in the, in, into the presentation. Um, the first, first one you can see there, um, you can actually bypass loading exchanges module. Um, you can basically say, I want a session. It's a slightly different syntax for setting up the session to exchange, but then we can get a list of exchange mailbox databases from that session. And that saves us loading the, the exchange module, which is actually just going to do remoting anyway. But there are other things where we need to supply a, a credential string. And I just wanted to show this, as I say, because um, it's a useful trick to have up your sleeve. And I'm getting really nervous because I'm going to run out of time here. But I've already created a credentials file. Okay, for this user called demo user. When you look at the uh, credentials file, you can see here the password is saved as a, as a secure string. So I can import that, and you can see here is the user's password. The user's called demo user, and their password is demo user with a capital D, because I really believe in security. Okay, so now. I'm going to use that credential to start a new PowerShell session. And that started as demo user. So I haven't had to type in any credentials. And I can actually see that file, because it's in the public directory. There it is, same secure string. But what happens when I try and import that file that's actually got my password in it, not that I know it's my password, 
I can't convert the secure string as a different user. Okay, so we could set up these credential files, leave them on the server, and then if, we, if the uh, business logic said, okay, you need to uh, connect to Office 365 and provision this user's account, well, we could do that. So we actually use that method to uh, safely save credentials. The other thing was everything's running as the, um, the elevated account. So we've got no logging that tells us who did anything because whenever you say who did this, it says the elevated account did. Yes. So you can, provided the, provided the user who is trying to import the file, just to answer that question, can you use that safe credential as a way to get around the double hop problem? Yes. If the account that's trying to read the file has got, is able to decode the secure string, then you can use that to read the credentials and, and get around a double hop problem. Um, so, the logs were, any, any logs would just say, oh yeah, my privileged user cha changed this user account or enabled this user for link or whatever. So we said, no, nah, that's not really going to be any good. What we need to do is remember who it is that started the session and actually write to the Windows event log where the script is running everything that they've done. So we created our own uh, event log. Um, we were able to get who the user was and then write to the event log everything that they did. And there's just a quick view of it. We, we, got, we got quite clever with it and we said, well, we'll use 100 numbers to say we were doing something with AD. Uh, and um, 102 is we changed them, uh, 103 is we added them to a group and so on. So this is actually a live screenshot from the real system. This user, Barry, had his job title changed to something or other technician. Um, so, using an endpoint and creating a module for it, I'm just going to do this really, really quickly so that you can see the last of it happening, um, because I have three minutes to go. I will overrun, but... Um, so, here... Oh, thank you. So here, um, we have the module. So here, I'm just going to say, let's go and get the, who the assumed user is and write that to the event log. Um, we're going to hire, we're going to just import get printer from that module. We're going to uh, define the functions that we need. Okay, so here we're just going to make get printer available. And then down here in our business logic, I've got something for restart spooler. Okay, and then the final thing is I'm going to set the language context. So, what I should be able to do is um, register that as an endpoint. <coughs> I thought I had deleted that. Well, I'm going to assume that that's okay, that I that I just hadn't deleted that from from the last time I ran it. So now what I can do is I can create a new session. And if I go and enter that session, you can see I haven't got a proper prompt which tells me I've got restricted language. So if I do something like DIR here, um, it's not recognized. But if I say get printer, that miraculously works. And I can take that and I can actually export that to um, another, uh, to a persistent module. And what I'm going to do instead of exporting that is I'm going to come over to the demo user that I had and the module should be called remote printers and
if I do restart spooler, so if I just try and restart the spooler service, restart service spooler, it should turn around and go, you're just an ordinary user, you're not allowed to do that. But if I use the commands in that exported module, which I've got from my remote session, it says, ah, yeah, I understand what you're trying to do. You're creating a, uh, I'll, I'll create a session so that you can run that in the uh, remote, in the remote session. Let's try and do that properly. And if we go and have a look in Event Viewer, somewhere near the top of the application log, we should see it's logged that. So here we go. I hope you can see that there. It basically says, demo user started a remote session, and then a couple of seconds later, demo user restarted the spooler. So we've got all that logged. So that's how it all works. And two last things, really. One was, with all the business logic we built, we ended up saying we need to create some forms to make it easier for users. So that was the customization we did to the exported module. We basically wrote something that said, if you do get HR info and you get information for this user, you can then pipe that information into something that will call the remote function, and someone from IT just has to fill that form in. So that was part of making their lives easier. Um, we wrote lots of pester script to test it. Um, the technical lessons for all of this, well, they're the ones that we've shown you above. Um, we, you, we, we found creating an endpoint to live, deliver services was something we went back to again and again and again. Um, figuring out the logging, figuring out the credentials problem, doing that GUI wrapper I just showed you, and actually proving that it did what it was supposed to do were all the, the major things. The non-technical lessons, I learned more about technical debt doing this thing than I, I, I thought it was possible to know. Um, this whole thing from Formula One of do it quickly and then, then get it right if you have to just made life in, in really hard for IT. Um, the other thing was the, you couldn't just replace like for like. You had to, you had to make life better for the people that were going to use it. Um, and it was very much an agile thing of deliver it ah, we've got more requirements, deliver another version. So it was deliver, test, deliver, test, enhance, go back, and keep doing it. Um, the other thing, um, management buy-in. Uh, there, are, there are nights when I wake up and I think, you know, I might still be working there if I'd actually persuaded the management that this was more important than they seemed to think it was. So that's that. Right, we need to clear out, but I saw somebody waiting. Was that to say time to get out, or you've got a question? One quick thing. Everybody can go to aka.ms slash gia.docs for the latest uh, release of Gia, so you can implement it your own environment. So just, just to repeat that, aka.ms slash gia.docs is the URL if you want to get more information to implement your own. Thank you, everybody. Have a great conference.